Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Fish Market Academy. So last week, we were talking about decentralized exchanges, where providing liquidity on today's protocols can earn you a great source of passive income. That is also popularly known as liquidity mining or yield farming. So whenever you hear those terms, it's basically providing liquidity to a protocol or a platform. This week, we will be briefly exploring derivatives, insurance, oracles, as well as governance tokens. Those topics on its own are pretty heavy because, well, we are rebuilding the financial system and I may go into more details on those individual topics in a future video. So let's get started. Alright, so let's start off with derivatives. As its name suggests, derivatives derive its value from its underlying asset. And there are a few common types of derivatives, mainly perpetuals, uh, also known as perps, futures, options, and synthetic assets. So perps basically is a way for you to bet on the price movement of a token, whether it goes up and down, uh, without actually owning the token. So you actually collateralize using stable coins to bet on whether the token uh, on, or underlying asset goes up, on, up or down. So perps can last forever, that's why they are called perpetuals, uh, and your position basically doesn't have an expiry time, unlike futures or options, uh, but they do have a funding rate. So usually uh, when the funding rate is positive, it means that there are more people longing the market, and therefore you have to pay a very small interest, uh, usually every 8 hours or maybe once a day, uh, to maintain the perpetual position. So perps or perpetuals are basically a way for investors to long or short an asset without actually owning it, and they use uh, stablecoins as collaterals to long and short it. Uh, so they are called perpetuals because they last forever and your position never has an expiry date unlike futures or options. But they do have a small funding rate. Uh, for example, if the funding rate is positive, it means that more people are longing. And in order to ensure that the perpetual uh, price is similar to the underlying spot price, the positive funding rate incentivizes shorts to actually come in to short the perpetual contract and receive the funding and keep the price close to the spot price. So popular perp platforms, try saying that three times in a row, uh, include FutureSwap, DYDX as well as uh, Perpetual Protocol. And one interesting thing about perps is that they allow you to use leverage, uh, but generally uh, leverage is a dangerous tool and I wouldn't recommend using it uh, unless you are professional and know exactly what you're doing. Um, Futures are similar to perps, uh, just that they have an expiration date and when the expiration date comes, then the parties involved are obligated to trade with each other at their predetermined price. A uh, popular decentralized derivatives platform uh, include DMAX, uh, which the founders are actually from Singapore as well, so that's pretty cool. And uh, Derivit is a pretty common centralized uh, futures platform. Uh, Derivit and I think also Bybit is also doing uh, futures. One interesting thing to note about futures is that they often carry a premium. So a premium means that the futures contract is actually worth more than the current spot price. So if you look at like for example a September futures contract, there might be a small uh, maybe 3 to 5% premium uh, above the spot price. So they are 3 to 5% higher than the spot price. And you might be wondering why that's the case. But the general consensus is that crypto tends to trend up. So this this general trend upness is basically giving futures contract a premium. So a popular future strategy is to short the futures contract and basically buy the underlying spot contract so that you can capture the premium. So if the September contract is 5% uh, more expensive than the spot price, you will short the futures contract and you buy the spot underlying contract and you basically can capture the premium. And that's how professionals um, basically use futures to hedge their position as well as to collect premium. So they get, they get paid to hedge their position basically. So that's pretty useful. Uh, this strategy is known as cash and carry and it's a common strategy that uh, institutions that use BlockFi, Nexo, Hodonot, uh, also also use. So you might be wondering how on earth can they be giving you the interest that you're earning on this kind of uh, lending pl platforms like BlockFi and Celsius. Basically, they take your uh, asset and then they lend it out to these financial institutions and then they could do a strategy such as cash and carry, which is generally a risk-free method because they are basically just arbitraging the premium and they collect the premium. So it's generally very safe and a bit consistent as well. And again, perps and futures, they do allow for leverage, but I strongly, strongly don't advise doing leverage. Like its name suggests, leverage is basically level H. All it does is just level your age and make you grow a lot older, a lot quicker. So it's not something I would advise. Uh, so options is pretty complicated on its own. Uh, it's also known as like the holy grail of derivatives because of how flexible and useful it can be. And it basically gives the buyer the, the right, but not the obligation, to actually buy or sell an underlying asset at an agreed upon time and price. So 
if you know for sure what's going to happen in a certain time, options is a great way to actually um, place a bet. But if you don't know the time and you only know the direction, then maybe perps and futures are a good way to place that bet. So options is like one level higher. You need to know not just the direction, but also the time where that direction will happen. So it's pretty complicated. Um, but I will be going into options in a future video because options are a great way to so-called uh, yield farm as well. Not exactly, but you basically can provide uh, insurance to the market or lottery tickets to the market in order to earn more income on your existing assets. So it's something that I do very often and I will be sharing more about that in a future video. Uh, popular options platform include like Open and Hedgic, but honestly I think they are not that commonly used. But most people that I know that use options uh, trade on Deribit, which is also another centralized options platform. But the liquidity that they have in the protocol, or, or in this case the platform, is a lot higher. So you are able to enter and exit trades uh, a lot better without much slippage. So finally, synthetic assets. So synthetic assets are basically assets on a blockchain that mimics the price of its asset in the real life. And that's pretty cool because they mimic the price in real life, but they have all the benefits of being on the blockchain, which means they are permissionless. You can send it to anybody at any time and anywhere, more or less instantly at very low cost. Right? There is no like um, uh, permission or someone has to have an account. If someone, if you know a friend who is in a third world country and they basically want to have access to, let's say, uh, Tesla or Google, uh, and they want to be able to buy these this, this platforms or all these shares, they can't use platforms like TD Ameritrade because they probably can't create an account with them. But they can actually buy these synthetic assets to gain the exposure to these assets without the need to go through the traditional uh, platforms which they may not have access to. So pretty awesome in terms of democratizing uh, finance to the rest of the world. And the way these platforms or uh, these assets make sure that their price is packed to the underlying is through uh, three different types of um, components. Basically, there is an oracle. They basically pull the data from the real life price to the, to the smart contract. And there is a liquidation engine. So when you mint the asset, the mirror asset or the synthetic asset, you are basically in a way shorting it. Uh, because if you want to long the asset, you don't mint it, you will just buy it. When you mint the asset, you usually mint it to sell it. Um, so when you sell it or when you short it, right? when you mint to sell, it's basically shorting because you mint with a borrowed amount due to collateralization. And if the price keeps going up, then you may be get you, you may get liquidated, uh, and the liquid liquidation engine will kick in uh, once it hits a liquidation point uh, due to your collateralization ratio being too low, for example. So if that sounds very complicated. I will be talking about this in a future video very very soon. Uh, mainly going through the Mirror Protocol, which is a very awesome protocol, like similar to Robinhood but on the blockchain. And the last part is arbitrages on an hourly to hourly basis or even like minute to minute basis. They come in to arbitrage the price. So if the price is too high above its spot price, like for example, Tesla is at $600, but the price on Mirror has gone all the way up to $620 due to like rampant speculation or people just want to farm uh, the, the Tesla on Mirror, then they will actually come in to short it and they get paid to short it because there is also now short farming on Mirror platform, which is pretty awesome. You get paid to short to push the price back down to its spot price. So I look forward to my video on Mirror Protocol very soon. Okay, Oracles. So Oracles are most popularly used for price feeds. And what that means is they pull the price feed from other real world sources like Google Finance, Yahoo Finance, and then uh, in terms of assets or tokens like your Bitcoin, uh, Ethereum, they would pull from multiple sources like your Coinbase, your Binance, uh, even Uniswap, and they would give an index on average of all these prices to actually uh, determine that that is like the main price because there are a lot of protocols that have to rely on an accurate pricing in order to ensure that their liquidation is done correctly. So in terms of Mirror's case, Basically, whenever you are minting an asset, you need to know what is the real life price so that the platform or the protocol will actually be able to take the real life price and use your collateralization ratio to create a liquidation price so that the system um, doesn't go haywire, basically. So protocols like Mirror require the real life stock price in order to ensure that there is a soft pack to the synthetic uh, asset price. And they do this by using Oracle services where they pull or they relay data from the outside world into the blockchain world. Think of them as a bridge in allowing the blockchain protocols to interact with data and networks from the non-blockchain world. 
and that's what oracles do. Uh, the most popular oracle is Chainlink with a lot of projects integrating with their uh, Chainlink protocol to get price feeds. And the second most popular one is Band Protocol. So Mirror actually uses Band Protocol for their price feeds. Alright, so insurance. As we know, DeFi has been exploding tremendously. Uh, I think they have grown more than 20 times in terms of the total value lock since one year alone. And it is now sitting at around 50 billion in total value lock, so that's a lot. This tremendous growth in DeFi is attracting new protocols and new investors to, to come in every single day. And it is very important that DeFi investors has, have a way to invest in these protocols uh, in a safe and secure way by having insurance on their investments. So that's where insurance protocols come in. And they play a very big part in the whole DeFi ecosystem. Because in 2020 alone, uh, I believe around $120 million was exploited uh, from various DeFi protocols. And in 2021, I am very sure the number is much, much higher, probably in the, in the hundreds of millions and maybe even a billion dollar has been exploited already uh, in 2021. So insurance helps to mitigate some of these risks because if your uh, protocol has an exploit, right, and you purchase insurance, you do get a compensation uh, in when, when that happens. But of course, there are terms and conditions that apply. So Nexus Mutual is the most popular insurance protocol and they do provide insurance for most of the top uh, protocols including Anchor Protocol. So Anchor Protocol actually does offer Nexus Mutual insurance as well. So if you feel that the Anchor Protocol is a bit risky, it's a bit dangerous, you don't know whether you can put all your UST inside or not, you can actually buy Nexus Mutual insurance. So in the event that the Anchor Protocol has an exploit and the funds are drained, uh, Nexus Mutual may be able to compensate you for that. And one cool thing about uh, insurance platforms on DeFi is that they are decentralized and it's peer-to-peer -peer insurance. So they basically have a group of people that is providing the, the insurance pool and people would buy from them and it removes the third party. So there is no more insurance company. It's basically a group of individuals providing the insurance pool and people are buying insurance from this pool and that's how the whole system works. So it's pretty interesting. I, I might talk about that in a future video. Alright, so governance. Governance tokens are one of the most interesting things happening in DeFi right now and they are basically voting rights to a certain protocol. So if you hold a governance token, you're basically like a shareholder and similar to shareholders in real life, you get to create proposals and you get to vote on proposals whether you want to vote yes or vote no or abstain from voting for the proposal and this, this makes you feel like a part of the entire protocol because you have a say in the protocol. So one cool thing about governance tokens is that they also capture value from the transaction fees in the protocol and that makes them uh, like a company whereby they have a treasury and whenever there are trans transactions and they take a portion of the transactions as fees, uh, protocol fees, uh, these fees usually go into the treasury and this treasury is decentralized and is owned by uh, basically the people that hold the governance token and then they can vote on how they want to spend this treasury similar to how uh, companies work when they are they are owned by various shareholders and then they will come together and vote on how to spend the budget for the company so it's pretty interesting and governance tokens can actually be a way to assess whether a token is undervalued or overvalued. So uh, one of the most uh, exciting governance token right now is XC Infinity, uh, which is actually a game on the blockchain. So it's an NFT game similar to Pokemon. You collect XCs and then you fight it either in PvE or PvP battles. And then you collect uh, SLPs, which is like their currency. And whenever people buy or sell XCs on the marketplace, they, there's a 4.25% transaction fee that goes into the XC Infinity Treasury and the, the amount has completely exploded upwards. So right now, XC Infinity is the most profitable governance token in all of DeFi. Uh, they basically have more revenue than every single DeFi project combined in the past 7 days at least. So that is pretty insane. And if you use their earnings as like revenue, you can actually calculate things like uh, PE ratio, PS ratio to see whether or not how overvalued they are compared to traditional metrics. Speaking about PE ratio and PS ratio for X Infinity, because of how much revenue they actually generate, they are actually relatively cheap 
Uh, I'm not sure about right now when the price is about over twenty dollars, but uh, when they were around three dollar, I actually got in. Uh, I did inform the premium group as well. So if you are interested to know about my moves and my positions uh, and my portfolio, uh, we also do have a premium group, and I will share basically all my research. And that's how I shared about buying X Infinity when it's under four dollars just literally three weeks ago. So that's that. That was pretty good. But definitely lucky in terms of the timing. I, I didn't expect it to go up so fast. It's right after the research then Delphi Digital actually talked about it and uh, Delphi Digital basically pumped up the price but we managed to get in before the Delphi Digital published their research so the research was pretty on point as well so that's pretty good Okay, um, so there are a lot of DeFi risks as well so we'll be exploring some of these DeFi risks the main DeFi risk is smart contract bugs, which means the smart contract has certain uh, unintended uh, features or functions that the founder either deliberately or undeliberately include inside, which could allow it to be exploited and the funds can be drained or there can be an infinite mint attack whereby they will just mint infinite amount of that governance token, sending the price basically all the way down to zero or it could have a rug pool which means that the funds the, or the funds inside the contract can be removed away from the contract and sent to another party so these are the main types of exploits and it's very important to know that um, even established projects may have bugs so never put all your eggs in one basket and uh, try not to invest more than what you can afford to lose other miscellaneous risks would include like high network fees and congestion. So sometimes if you're on Ethereum, right, the fees for making any type of uh, transactions can be high. And this can basically affect the amount of money that you make on this kind of uh, platform. So do take note of that. A congestion is not too big of an issue at, at the moment. Um, but it's basically, it basically means that sometimes your transaction can take uh, literally hours or it will never happen uh, because of how congested the network is unless you pay a higher gas price so that's a bit uh, technical and right now we're not having that problem um, so I won't be going too much into it okay impermanence loss is basically a type of loss a uh, temporary loss that happens due to the price movement uh, in a trading pair so for example uh, if you have Tesla and Tesla UST liquidity and then your Tesla price goes up uh, you, you will actually have lesser Tesla tokens because people would buy the Tesla from the pool and that's why the price will go up but you will actually have lesser Tesla shares um, because they will give you more UST but you don't want more UST when Tesla goes up you want the Tesla share so you do have a little bit of impermanence loss the yield that you get from providing the liquidity is often more than enough to cover your uh, loss your impermanence loss as long as it's not too drastic. If Tesla goes up uh, 100% in, in, in one month, um, it's pretty drastic and you are going to get a bit more impermanence loss. But you don't actually lose money, you just earn less. You earn less compared to just holding Tesla and holding UST because uh, your UST will remain stable, but your Tesla will go up in value uh, if you just hold them separately. But in a pool, when your Tesla goes up in value, people are basically buying away your Tesla from you and giving you UST. And that causes a slight loss in potential profit, but you are still earning. So it's a case of whether you earn more or earn less, but you're earning, so it's pretty good. Uh, but on the flip side, if you are actually holding a governance token and pairing like your liquidity, for example, USDC with uh, Sushi, for example, and then sushi price crashed all the way because there is a certain um, minting exploit where they just mint infinite sushi for example and then your sushi price goes all the way down to let's say zero dollars you will also have no USDC left because these two asset when sushi price goes down they're basically selling sushi and they're selling sushi to you while they take your USDC so when sushi price goes all the way down to zero dollars you basically have all the sushi but they're worth zero dollar and you have no USDC left. So even though you provided both assets as a pair, in extreme scenarios, your entire pool can go to zero dollars if the price crashes. So it's something very dangerous to take note about. Okay, so I put up a quick chart on impermanence loss. And as you can see, when you have a 100% of the current price, which means the price don't move on both of your pairs, you don't lose anything. 
But when it drops 50%, for example, which is around here, you will notice that you lose maybe around 25% um, uh, around there. Uh, for your total equity. So providing liquidity with a stablecoin pair actually does allow you to lose less as well. Because if you only hold sushi and it drops 50%, well, you lost 50% of its value. Um, but if you are holding sushi with USDC, this pool, and sushi drops 50%, your total pool asset, basically sushi and your USDC, the total value drops by 25% only, which is not so bad. Uh, but if it drops all the way down to 0%, your impermanence loss is 100%. So it does get exponential the more it drops. So that's something to take note about. And on the bullish side, it usually caps out at around... Um, so it doesn't cap out, but it usually is around 25% loss if it goes up by 500%. But honestly, if it goes up by 500%, you'll be pretty happy and that 25% loss just basically means that you are at 400%, which is still 5x, so that's pretty good. Yeah, so bringing back about uh, DeFi risk and smart contract risk, security audits or smart contract audits are very popular and Certing and Hacken are popular uh, auditors. So they basically audit smart contracts and they will highlight any type of bugs. Uh, just because a project has been audited by Certic and Hacken, it does not mean that they are safe. Because a project may only be audited for certain parts. They may not be auditing the entire protocol. So you have to check the audit as well to see whether or not they have audited everything. Or did they only audit a certain amount of things? Because the protocol, when they engage Certic or Hacken, they can pay them to just audit a certain part of the protocol. And then you just... They just put big big audited by static but the only part they audit is basically a uh, copy and paste set code which is obviously going to be um, no issues so it can be a bit sneaky so you want to make sure that you are looking at the audit as well you got to audit the audit right in in DeFi in blockchain um, the slogan is don't trust verify so even if you see a static logo or hacker logo it's also good to verify them especially if you're gonna put in large sums of money and RugDog is the community that I mentioned about. Just because RugDog has approved it, it does not 100% mean that they are safe. Although it does give a lot more credibility and assurance that it is safe because they are quite uh, good from what, uh, from what I've seen. Yeah, so this video has been pretty long, so I'm just going to wrap up here. And basically, DeFi is looking to disrupt traditional finance. We call it TradFi. Due to all of the different components that they are building in DeFi, that is replacing each of the components in the traditional finance network. From your lending protocols, to your insurance, to your governance, to your um, assets and equities. So the entire financial industry is being recreated in decentralized finance that is completely open and permissionless and transparent, which can be a great thing for many people around the world that do not have access to, to traditional finance. And furthermore, the innovation happening in DeFi is pretty insane due to the ability for great code to be built on top of each other. Yeah, and I think this is going to really disrupt banking and finance because half the world is underbanked or unbanked and they can ignore traditional financial services uh, and go straight into decentralized finance services like, like basically DeFi uh, through the lending and borrowing protocols, the savings plan and the ability to invest in equities to ensure that their investment portfolio continues to grow and things like that all without having to go through banks which may reject them due to um, income reasons, due to social status, due to religious status, things like that. So that, that's pretty amazing. And I think governments may fear this um, because they realize they can't really control it as much. They can ban it, which makes it a lot more inconvenient for a lot of people. But it's only a matter of time before um, people realize that this new DeFi world offers a lot more incentive uh, compared to the traditional financial system. I mean, the interest rates in the traditional financial, financial world is already so low. But in DeFi, your stable coin, your cash basically, can yield you anywhere from 5 to 20% per year, which is pretty awesome and, and we are very lucky to be in a, such a time where we can actually generate such high incomes on what is essentially cash. However, you are responsible for the security of your own funds and your own wallet. So that's something that makes a lot of people very fearful. Uh, but we will be talking about how you can actually protect your funds and your wallet uh, in a future video. And hopefully with that video, people will feel that it's less scary to actually be uh, managing your own funds. So hopefully you guys found this video useful. And if you have any questions, uh, do let me know in the comments below. And I will see you guys again soon. And hope you guys catch the biggest gains across the markets. Alright, see you guys. Bye.